it's a work day. We just uh, finished a long, hard day cutting the trees and starting to get dark. And we all got into this crew cab truck, you know. So that's how seven of us fit into this truck. Three in the front, four in the back. And we're driving down this uh, rough dirt road out of there. And uh, we saw some lights coming uh, through the trees, just little glimmers at first. Um, nobody was really particularly alarmed when we first saw it because... Uh, um, it was deer hunting season and, uh, you know, occasionally we'll see hunters or campers out. And so, uh, but, uh, as the closer we got, uh, the stranger it seemed because it was coming from above where I figured the top of the ridge would be, uh, little glimmers coming through the, uh, trees. Um, just, you know, a map here of where it happened, uh, on the rim. A lot of people don't know that there's quite a bit of forest in Arizona. So, um, when we finally got around the trees to where we could see it, there was kind of a break and opening there, and there this thing was, you know. It was just unmistakable. It was, uh, Alan Dallas yelled out, it's a fine saucer, right off the bat, because you know, the skeptics were trying to say, oh, they just saw the planet Jupiter off in the sky or something. <laughs> but there, there was no mistake, and this was a, a, a metallic uh, object hovering in the, in the sky there, uh, less than 100 feet away. But um, so many times when uh, we've been, uh, you know, in the woods and kept sight of a, an animal, you know, you say, there goes a bear, there goes a deer, you know. By the time the rest of the guys look, it's almost gone, you know, so that's kind of the impression I had here that, you know, it was just going to take off, and uh, so I jumped out of the truck and started towards it, thinking it would be gone before I got close, and what I was doing really alarmed the other guys, and they started yelling and screaming at me to get back in the truck, and I pretty quickly started having second thoughts about what I was doing myself, and I slowed down, and uh, I didn't want to look look foolish, and so I I made myself continue on. Um, we uh, could hear the rumble, the the sound that it was making. Um, it was a kind of a mixture of sounds, some very very high pitched and some very low rumbles. I think probably off the range of of human hearing on both ends of the of the spectrum. But uh, they were just screaming and yelling at me to get away from there. And, it, you know, that part of the movie was uh, pretty accurate. Uh, uh, at, at one point, you know, I got to where I was looking up at an angle, a pretty steep angle at it. Um, I couldn't really get in much closer because there was a big pile of logging debris there. But I was... Uh, standing there and it suddenly started to, to move. It rose up a little, and not real steady. It was kind of an unsteady motion and uh, the sound got louder, like it was powering up. It was real, uh, it, you know, you could feel it as well as hear it. And uh, it scared me, so I jumped down behind the end of a, a log that was sticking out of this a pile of debris and those guys were really frantic at uh, screaming at me to get back in the truck and and, uh, you know, I didn't need them to tell me that. I was uh, thinking, uh, how am I going to, you know, get out of here? I'm, I felt, you know, a little safer hiding behind the log, but I wanted to get... Uh, so I was thinking I would raise up and take off, uh, you know, just make a sprint back to the truck. But when I raised up, I just felt this shock go through my body. It's kind of like an electric shock. Uh, or if you've ever been hit real hard when you didn't see it coming. Uh, that's the way it felt, and I just blacked out. But the guys in the truck said that uh, a bolt of energy came out of the bottom of this craft and hit me in the upper body, and uh, it threw me back through the air. I said it just it just looked like a grenade going off. The, the force of the, of the blast, uh, um, one of the guys, Dwayne Smith, uh, he said that, you know, he, later he became an electrician, and he said, He's worked around high voltage. To him, it sounded really electrical, like a, like a lightning bolt or something. But 
in in the uh, in the police report, uh, uh, the the deputy that interviewed Ken Peterson, he said he described it as looking like a long blue flame. But you know whether it's a beam or a uh, lightning bolt or whatever, it they thought it killed me. Uh, they said it threw me back through the air and my body hit the ground limp and dust boiled up around me and they just knew they were next, you know, and uh, so they they panicked and left. And uh, those guys have gotten some criticism uh, for for fleeing, you know, but. Uh, I got to say, I, I I can't blame them, you know. In their in that situation that they were in, first of all, they thought I was dead. What good would it do to get themselves uh, killed, you know? If uh, it already killed me, they they are somebody yelled out, it killed him, um, and uh, everybody was telling the boss, let's go. And I don't think he needed to be told. He, they uh, they drove and almost wrecked the truck getting out of there. But they did what they what they had to do. It was really the smartest thing to do. They had no weapons, and so uh, they took off. And they went uh, as, as soon as they got to where they put some good distance between them. They stopped and they got out, and they said they were just all kinds of screaming and yelling, trying to decide what to do. And they started to build a fire, and I, I, don't know. I guess they didn't actually build a fire, but. I think what happened was a, a deer hunter uh, went by uh, out on the rim road, and so one of the guys suggested they chase them down and see if they could get help, you know, somebody with some guns. And so they tried that, and they weren't able to catch up with them. So uh, finally, uh, you know, Mike and Ken were saying, you know, we, we've got to go back, and and see if we can help them. And some of the other guys said, no way, you know, we shouldn't go back there, you know, it's too dangerous. But unlike in the movie where they got out to stand alone in the dark, I mean, these guys aren't going to do that, you know. They, they, they at least felt safer, you know, being in the truck. They all went back, not just Mike, like in the movie. So uh, I got to hand it to them for having the courage to do that, to, you know, figuring that the responsible thing to do was to try to rescue me and See if maybe I had survived what happened, and you know, if I needed help, they were gonna, tr they were gonna try to do something. So, um, although you know, I've kind of had some rough times with uh, some of the guys, especially the crew boss, about that, because my family, you know, sort of condemned them uh, for uh, not being more heroic immediately. Um, I got to give them credit that that was a very brave thing to do to go back that night and try to help. Uh, they did make a search, uh, they were unable to find me, and so then they went uh, back to town and they had quite an argument about what to do. Some of them said, well, let's just get some friends and relatives and go back, but uh, they uh, finally decided that they'd have to, you know, face the music and go to the authorities, uh, because, you know, they, you know, what if they, uh, um, I was never found, and it, you know, it just wouldn't be uh, a good thing for the law enforcement not to have been informed. So they went and uh, called uh, the local deputy, and he came down. And some of these guys were still crying. Everybody was so shook up. They knew something very terrible, something that had really happened. But uh, the deputy called the sheriff, and the under sheriff came with him. And, they all knew uh, something very terrible had happened, but they immediately had the suspicion that, you know, that we'd gotten into a fight and uh, I'd been killed and that these guys had uh, made up this story to cover up for why there was no more trials. So, uh, they had no, uh, the sheriff had no doubt that uh, something quite serious had happened. And uh, so, he took them back that night, uh, the sheriff did, and made a, a search of his own. And uh, again, you know, no results. Uh, the undersheriff was an expert tracker, uh, and uh, they were unable to find any trace of me. And uh, so 
Um, some of the guys in the crew have not been real proud about the way they reacted, you know, the fact that some of them cried and, and uh, were so, you know, panicked. But uh, their reactions are nothing compared to what I was going through. The uh, sheriff got a big search going that lasted five days. He crisscrossed the area with uh, men on horseback, uh, men on foot. And, uh, uh, they had uh, this helicopter here and uh, some uh, airplanes and uh, just uh, just comb the area. The tracking dogs uh, weren't of a whole lot of use. They uh, were not able to find any trail outside the clearing, uh, of course. <laughs> and so during the search, the uh, one of the Forest Service guys come up and grab Dwayne Smith by the collar and jerked him up there and said, all right, where'd you hide the body? And uh, so my brother intervened and uh, stopped the confrontation there, but the, but the men all said, look, you know, we're telling the truth. Give us sodium pentothal, lie detector test, and anything you want. And so uh, uh, the uh, sheriff uh, arranged for a lie detector test for the men, and uh, they brought in this man, uh, Cy Gilson, who was the state police polygraph examiner, had been for years, uh, the best in the state, and uh, he tested the men, and uh, they passed. Now, the um, the, um, the the media. Uh, it was reported to the media that one of the men had had an inconclusive, but uh, we got a hold of the uh, police file, and uh, they, uh, even the police file said that the sixth man's test was uh, that he had told the truth. But because he got in a big argument with the examiner and walked out, they gave him an inconclusive. But uh, that certainly did away with the theory that they killed me. I woke up, I was on my back, on a hard raised surface and uh, a light above me. I was in a lot of pain. Uh, I was in and out of consciousness for quite a, not a long time. But the pain you know, led me to th think that I'd been hurt and taken to a hospital. And I wasn't thinking real clearly, but I remembered approaching that object and thinking that so I must have been hurt somehow. You know. But uh, uh, I was lying on my back, and there was, there was a, a device uh, laying across my chest. And so I, I didn't want to move too much. It, it hurt to move, and I didn't want to interfere with anything the doctors might be done. But when I finally had my vision cleared a little better, and I saw these uh, creatures standing over me, you know, that was when I knew for sure I was not in the hospital. And uh, I, 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 I was so weak, I could hardly move. But uh, somehow I got the strength, and you know, I guess it was just a jolt of fear uh, at seeing these things and realizing where I was that uh, gave me a, a burst of energy and I was able to rise up and knock this thing off of me and, and uh, back away from them. They came around and came towards me, but I grabbed, there was a bunch of uh, instruments and things along this uh, uh, counter behind me, and I grabbed for something to defend myself with, and there was this long, clear uh, glass or plastic, it's either a rod or a tube or something like that, but um, I grabbed it and swung it at him, and then I hit it down on the table, trying to break the end of it off, get something sharp. I wasn't really trying to attack him, I was just trying to uh, keep him away from me, and it must have worked because uh, they stopped all at once before they were in, in range, and uh, I was, you know, just hysterical, uh, wailing at him, and uh, so all at once they uh, turned and uh, went out into the passage outside the door. This was a very dimly lit and cramped space. It was really very bare, not hardly anything in the way of 
features. Uh, I didn't see any screws, heads or bolts or rivets or welds or anything like that. In the movie they have it looking real organic and irregular and lots of debris around that wasn't like that. Uh, very sterile environment. They'd gone to the right and uh, so I was afraid they'd come back and I just wanted to get away from them. It wasn't, you know, anything well thought out. It was just sort of a panic move to just put some distance and try to try to get out of this thing, which might not have been too smart. I mean, had I been able to open the door or something, that might have been worse situation. But I tried. <laughs> so I, I went down this little narrow passage and I kept looking over my shoulder and wondering if they were pursuing me, but because the, it, the passage curved so tightly I couldn't see very far behind me or ahead of me, which really kind of, you know, made me feel, it just added to my panic. And so I just went ahead and scrambled forward and uh, I, I even went past one doorway that I might have been able to uh, escape through. but. I came to a door and there was a little room there with a uh, chair in the middle. And when I went in there, I could see that, that there were points of light uh, on the walls, the floor. Um, I don't know if this was a way that they had of viewing uh, the stars or you know where it was actually at at the moment or if it was just like a map or something. But uh, most of the controls that I was trying to operate, I was trying to see if I could open a door because there was some what looked like doorways on the other side of the room. But uh, most of them didn't seem to do anything. Uh, there were some controls that made these lines move on, on the screen, but nothing opened the door. Uh, there was one control that caused the star pattern to move. Not the stars relative to each other, but the whole thing just moved all at once, and that was real disorienting because, you know, it, my only reference for standing upright, you know, other than, you know, my sense of balance was the chair and the door had just come in. So, uh, that uh, may have brought someone, um, or it could have just been a coincidence, but I turned and there was a man, I, well, at least I thought he was a man, standing in the doorway. Um, I, I thought there was somebody there to, to help me, to rescue me, take me out of there. So I, I, I tried to ask him questions. I was telling him about these creatures that I had seen. and uh, uh, But he, he, he didn't answer me, and uh, I thought maybe that was because he was wearing a helmet over his head. So, so when he... Uh, you know, led me out of there, I went, uh, you know, only too willingly to, you know, if he was going to help me escape. And um, so, when, when we got outside the craft, at, at this point it was uh, inside of a large room, either a building, sort of a hangar-like thing, or maybe part of a larger craft. And um, I tried to look around, but he seemed to be in a big hurry. He uh, led me out of this larger room. And it was quite a relief just to be outside, uh, away from the, those creatures, be in, you know, into the brighter light and cooler air, much more breathable. And uh, so he, he led me down a, a hallway to a, a room. And, left me with some other people who were dressed like him, except they weren't wearing helmets. And so I started in with all my questions again, what was going on. Uh, actually, it was just a bunch of babbling and screaming, but <laughs> I, was, I was trying to get them to tell me something, and, and they uh, uh, weren't answering me. So I started to have a lot of misgivings about whether I was... Um, rescued or not, you know. They started leading me over to this table. You know, I'd had enough of laying on tables, you know. <laughs> but they, they were trying to get me to lay down on this thing, so I started trying to fight them. And uh, 
I was still pretty weak uh, from when I regained consciousness, but you know, my panic gave me a little extra strength, but they were way too strong. They were able to get me up on the table pretty easy, but I got one arm free and reached under the edge of this mask they put over my face and tried to pull it away, but before I could get it off of there, uh, I blacked out. And uh, so the next thing I uh, recalled was uh, waking up. It was cold out. I was on a hard pavement. And uh, there was a light above me, so I looked to see where the light was coming from. And it went off just as I looked. So it was either like a light fixture or a hatch closing or something. But uh, then it was just this shiny metallic thing hovering above the road. Uh, and, and then it just shot straight up into the sky. Uh, it was gone from sight so incredibly fast, but it didn't make a sound. It uh, was pretty silent, and uh, I could feel uh, just a faint warmth on my face. But other than that, there was it just sort of moved the, the tree as it went past. Um, just the air moving around a little bit. And uh, so uh, I looked around and I saw the lights of the city down below, the, the little town of Heber. This is the town nearest where this happened, I, I recognized. So again, I didn't know where I was getting the strength, but I, uh, in a panic, just ran down into the town. And uh, there was a building with lights on and smoke coming out of the chimney and I went and pounded on the door and nobody came so I went on down across the bridge across the next bridge and there was a little uh, service station Exxon station there with three telephone booths in a row went into the telephone booth picked up the receiver and it was out of order and, uh, I went into the next one and it worked and that part of the country at that time, you could talk to the operator without even putting coins in the machine. And, uh, so I called my my family, my uh, brother-in-law, and he said he'd get my brother and come and get me. And uh, so it must have, I, I just collapsed there, and it seemed like the next thing I knew they were there, but you know. Took them. I must have taken them a half an hour to get there, but uh, they found me in the phone booth with my feet braced against the door, and uh, I was in pretty bad shape. I tried to talk to them about, uh, you know, what had happened, but I just it was too hysterical. I broke down and I said, "Oh, don't try to talk right now." But in in what was being said. Uh, I, they gathered what well, I was assuming that this was the same night that, uh, that I'd been taken. And they said, Travis, you've been gone for five days. And feel your face. And I had five-day uh, growth of beard. And, and so that was quite a shock, too. I looked at the date on my watch, and it had changed. And I just, I just kind of, uh, you know, lapsed into... I, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, function any further than that. They took me in and had quite a emotional uh, reunion with my mother and some family members. And, but uh, you know, the, the, during during this five days of search, you know, the sheriff had tried to keep the lid on things, not telling the media about what had happened and. Uh, but it, it got out with, you know, 50 searchers, and they've all got families, and they tell them what they're doing. So it was a worldwide uh, news story, and there were uh, media from all over the world and, and in town. And I was in such a fragile condition that my brother felt it was smart to get me out of there. So he wanted to, you know, take me to, uh, to the doctor and check me out. So, uh, during the search, uh, he, he'd met a UFO investigator who said, you know, if he's ever returned, he'd come to us and we'd, you know, provide all this uh, research, medical testing, and whatnot, I'm sure it's okay, which is <laughs> quite a remarkable.
remarkable thing, you know. Uh, but uh, so uh, he called this guy up and set up a, a meeting with his doctor and his membership, and it's it's really a terrible mistake, you know. It's, it's kind of a disreputable group. It was kind of represented in the movie as a far another another group no longer exists, but. Turned out the guy wasn't really a doctor, and it was just a big fiasco. So uh, finally, uh, you know, went back to my brother's house, and uh, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, which was uh, based in Tucson at that time, uh, figured out from the various conflicting uh, media reports, because my brother just arbitrarily to throw the media off had said, "Well, he's in a Tucson hospital," but they checked, and uh, that wasn't true. So. They called the house and figured out and uh, persuaded my brother that they could uh, you know, provide some legitimate medical uh, care to uh, make sure I was okay. And so um, I, I went in uh, and saw a couple of uh, legitimate medical doctors uh, that were in the APRO membership and uh, had a, a battery of tests run. Already the media, you know, once once the, uh, the murder theory went away, they were trying to explain it away as drugs. And this original flaky group tried to, you know, claim that it was a drug hallucination. But um, there some of the medical tests that were done were, uh, I had uh, blood and urine samples uh, put through the county medical examiner's drug screen. Showed no trace of any drug in my body. And I had a, a EKG, EEG, and so a lot of other tests. And they continued with quite a few tests, um, and it was ongoing. Anyway, the, uh, Dr. Harder uh, administered some, uh, you know, performed some uh, regressive hypnosis, and um, that was the first time I was able to uh, finally uh, verbalize what had happened to me without the fear. You know, with the fear there, I, I couldn't even get it out. I just break down. I was pretty, pretty traumatized by the whole thing. You know, uh, maybe modern uh, audiences, uh, they hear about that and they think, you know, that's not so fantastic. They've been ra raised on, you know, the movie special effects kinds of things, you know. But this this is real life, you know, and uh, I think under the circumstances, the you know, the pain I was in, the the feeling of suffocation and claustrophobia, all that, you know, combined with suddenly seeing these creatures just contributed to the to the panic I was feeling, especially that suffocation. Now in the movie they have the actor uh, struggling to breathe with this membrane over his face. Now that didn't happen to me, but, you know, I was um, feeling suffocating. I, I couldn't breathe and the air just it wasn't... I don't know whether the atmosphere wasn't right or had something to do with the injury that uh, from being hit by the beam it interfered with lung function or something. But uh, you know, when you can't breathe, there's nothing that's going to make you panic more, you know, especially in a real closed-in space like that. So uh, other people think they might have been able to handle it better. This this uh, uh, is me talking to. Uh, Leo Sprinkle, who performed a lot of the psychiatric examinations. This is me talking to uh, J. Allen Hynek. And uh, there was uh, a lot of research going on back and forth, a lot of testing and a lot of uh, theories trying to explain it all away. And, uh, you know, I, in the book I document every, every allegation that the skeptics made, and one by one I uh, disprove those. Uh, and, uh, but in the aftermath of, of all this uh, came the movie, and we were doing uh, interviews for the movie, and it was hard copy or entertainment tonight, or one of those. Um, wanted to go out to the site, and this was in the middle of winter, and there was three feet of snow out there, but they wanted to go anyway. It's almost impossible to get there, so they rented one of these big snow cats that they use at the ski run. And, we were plowing through the drifts and went back there and did the interview on the site. And uh, uh, we had a little trouble finding it, but I thought it was because of the snow. But apparently, um, Mike, who, he was doing the interview with me, 
Uh, he was the crew boss. Uh, he uh, noticed a big change in the trees there, and so, you know, he didn't ever say anything to us or the interviewers. Uh, and uh, he went back after the snow melted and, and started checking things out. And uh, he discovered that the trees right near where the craft came down um, had suddenly gotten a lot bigger. And uh, so uh, he took uh, a core sample, and you can see from this sample that, you know, you could, uh, especially if you could see the whole slide, I think you, what you're seeing is more complete than what I'm seeing here. But um, you can see that the uh, counting back uh, the number of years to the incident, the winter of 75, 76, that the rings were really broad. And from that point back, they're much, much thinner. And uh, he was able to calculate, you know, a, a tree is not just a cylinder, it's a tall cone, actually. And using the formula for the volume of a cone, he was able to de uh, determine that these trees had produced 36 times uh, the previous uh, growth rate for producing you know, wood fiber. Uh, just, just an incredible jump. And uh, during the search, other uh, researchers went out there and uh, uh, measured some unusual uh, ozone readings. Of course, those dissipated very quickly, but there was uh, also um, some magnetic readings that were really uh, strange, that there was a, a kind of a, a, a dip on one side of the clearing and then the direction that the craft had left, there, it was a, there was a spike with a polarity reversal. And all that was uh, charted out and uh, put into the APRO file. Well, when uh, Paramount, uh, you know, was, hel uh, was helping them uh, research, uh, you know, preparing for the movie, uh, we went to try to get the file, and uh, it had pretty much disappeared. And uh, they uh, wanted us to go and see what we could do about getting the police file. And since it was a closed case, uh, you know, the sheriff's department said, sure, no problem, come back tomorrow, we'll have a copy for you. Well, by the time we went back, they said, uh, we can't find it. It's gone. So, another disappearing file. But uh, the sheriff, uh, I don't think he was hiding it because uh, he had some copies of some of that material in, in his own personal files that he uh, let us have. And uh, there was a lot of interesting things in there. Uh, some other hunters, uh, campers in that area had uh, seen uh, the craft. And, uh, but one of the most interesting things was that um, during, during the pr preparation, the media uh, blitz before the movie, uh, a guy called up and said uh, that he had uh, been out there deer hunting at the time of the incident. And uh, he described the, the terrain, and this is a re very remote area, and you'd have to be there to be able to describe what he was describing. No, the location was never precisely, uh, you know, laid out in any media reports. So, you know, I, that caught my attention that he, you know, had to, had to have been there to at least know the train. But he said he was on the next ridge and he saw the uh, glow of the craft and the, and the blast of the beam and all this. And uh, so I thought that was pretty impressive. But, you know, I was just at home for a day and back off on, on uh, the road uh, doing interviews. Uh, but uh, so I, I told Tracy Torme, the scriptwriter, about this guy. and. Unbeknownst to me, they flew him out to Hollywood, interviewed him, and um, for whatever reason, Paramount decided to have him polygraphed. And so they uh, enlisted the, uh, the services of uh, the state police polygraph examiner, who was now in private practice at that time, um, in Phoenix, to test him. And it was uh, very strange, very strange results. He uh, was proven to be telling the truth about being there, about seeing the craft, and about what, why he didn't come forward at the time. He explained to me on the phone that uh, he'd been in military intelligence at the time. He was stationed in Texas, and uh, he'd asked his superior, "Should I, should I come forward?" And, you know, these guys are accused of murder. And uh, he said his superior officer said, uh, "Well, 
unless they're indicted, just stay out of it. So he didn't. He said he always felt bad about that. He said he could, you know, that his wife was uh, with him, he said, and that uh, even though they were now divorced, that she would verify that, that this really happened. Um, but on the test, it, it, it showed that he, yes, was in military intelligence. Yes, he, he did see these things. But when they questioned him about his connections to uh, Philip Class and, and the people who were trying to discredit this, he flunked it just as badly as, uh, as he could, which was very alarming. Uh, but uh, Paramount just, you know, warned him, and uh, I haven't heard or seen from him since. But it's always bothered me because, you know, it's proven that here is a, a, someone from military intelligence, you know, right there, uh, you know, in such a remote area with, you know, with a high-powered rifle. And uh, that's, that's just always kind of bothered me. What, what, that uh, seems like too big of a coincidence. This is the polygraph examiner from the first uh, two tests that I took uh, and passed. These, these were uh, arranged to uh, the Aero Phenomena Research Organization. And uh, Mike and I have been off and on and, uh, in our relationship, and a lot of, a lot of well, harsh things went back and forth because of, uh, you know, um, not just them leaving that night and leaving me there to my fate. <laughs> uh, I feel I have no bad feelings about that. I think he thinks I think that. And, you know, my family's criticism of him. But even more than that, you know, it brought a lot of negative things into all of our lives. And so, you know, he was kind of like, uh, you know, if you hadn't have been so stupid as to get out of the truck and go over there, none of this would be happening. Um, it had a federal investigator come and just harass him about contracting. They, you know, I wrote up a, a, a confession and tried to get him to sign it. You know, it's a totally false confession. The, 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 uh, the investigator is the one that wrote it up. They were, he tried to claim that, uh, that uh, his, his one-time partner on contracting a brother didn't exist. He says, we're having a family reunion right now. I'll go and introduce you to him. He does exist. So they were just trying to do anything they could to uh, put pressure on him. I, I, you know, we got the message that they shut up and we'll make trouble for you. And we did find out that he, this, uh, this investigator, went down to the sheriff and got a look at the file um, on, the, um, on the UFO matter. So I think it was related. And um, there have been a number of things uh, connected to the government that have been quite disturbing that uh, kind of added up over time. Um, I did an interview here just a couple years ago with a, a lady that uh, was a reporter for the local newspaper. and. Uh, she was doing volunteer work with the, um, um, the Forest Service the following summer, uh, doing fire watch. And there's a lookout tower uh, called Gentry Tower, just uh, a mile or two to the uh, uh, west of uh, the uh, uh, site where the incident happened. And uh, a, a group of government men came through and they had all these instruments, and they wanted to know what they were doing. And these guys said, "Well, we're just we're just doing a survey of magnetic uh, uh, readings on the ground here." You know, you know, I know that these things are done, and they, you know that the various agencies have mapped out the uh, magnetic uh, you know, lines on the Earth. But uh, you know, my understanding of that was that this, you'd have an airplane with a long cable and the instrument would be, you know, hung below it and they just fly over the area. So it didn't make sense to me that, you know, that they need a whole team of federal guys uh, to go do this on the ground. So that was suspicious to me that, that maybe they were measuring something else or up to some other kind of thing. So a lot of connections with uh, federal government and uh, whatnot in the aftermath of this, it's been real suspicious to me about some sort of covert uh, involvement of some agency. But I've always been struck by um, coincidence uh, in this. And 
one thing was, you know, that face on Mars uh, looks a whole lot like uh, the guy <laughs> uh, that uh, I saw on board the craft. Now, the painting that I helped uh, the artist, uh, um, this is kind of off-center, but uh, um, it, they, this painting was made before these photos on Mars were ever taken, so, you know, it's, it's just a coincidence, and I thought it was kind of interesting, probably the meaning of things, especially since the uh, face on Mars, they showed it at a different time, and didn't, uh, didn't uh, look the same. Anyway, the aftermath over these years has been really, really hard to deal with, you know. The, the, the stress levels for such a long time after that happened were just so high, and so... Uh, you know, I'd wake up, yeah, and when I did sleep, you know, with this vision of these eyes. Uh, those creatures, when they were looking at me, it just seemed like they were looking right right into me, right right through me, in a, in a way that just affected me. Uh, it's hard to explain, but it wasn't, a, a, it wasn't overtly hostile, but I just interpreted that way because the emotional feeling that I got was that... Um, that there was no emotion, you know. When we interact with each other, if you if you sense that someone doesn't care about you one way or the other, we tend to interpret that as hostile. But beyond that, there was a sort of a a, a stare that just um, was just very disturbing to me, and it just bothered me for a long time. And that was one of the main features of my nightmares for a long time. When I started doing you know, a lot of interviews again when the movie came out, uh, you know, because at various times I, I'd get just so fed up with talking about it, I, I, I refused to do interviews for a while. But, so when I started doing those again, so many, I, I was thinking, this, you know, am I going to be able to tolerate this? Because every time I talked about it, it just knocked me up inside and break out in a sweat and just, you know, kind of relive it. But doing all those interviews really did sort of uh, help to desensitize me just going, putting myself through that, that stressful emotion over and over again has taken a lot of that away. You know, it used to be I'd get up and talk to a group like you about this and I'd just be, you know, drenched with sweat before it was over, but uh, it's gotten a lot better, but it's, it still never fails to make me feel it. And, uh, but you know, my nightmares kind of changed at the point uh, after that. Uh, about, about the time the movie came out, a lot of the nightmares seemed to involve more of the human-looking type and uh, little bits of things where I was being moved or carried somewhere. Just strange, though. Another really strange coincidence here, just a year or two ago, I found a topographical map of the state of Arizona, a whole book of them, and it was divided into areas. And I went to check out the area where the incident happened, and coincidentally, the end area where it happened was Area 51. Yeah, it just, it just blows my mind. You know, there's like almost a hundred a uh, areas in this topographical map, but Area 51's where it happened. So, go figure. Another one of those amazing coincidences. Either that or the map makers had a great sense of humor. But there's, there's the inset of Area 51, and uh, you can see just about in the, uh, in, the, in the upper third of it, you can see the rim crossing there and uh, where Turkey Springs was, or is, still is. I, sh I, sh I say was because they had a gigantic forest fire. I, I, it was the biggest forest fire in U.S. history. Over half a million acres burned. Two people started fires in two different places that came together, and it just, uh, it, the, 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 the conditions were the worst it could be, and it just burned and just burned and burned and burned. They really couldn't do more than just to try to save some homes, and, and they failed at a lot of that. Just a tremendous amount of damage. And the fire did burn through the Turkey Springs area, but, um, Remarkably, some of the trees that had uh, ex uh, exhibited this phenomenal growth survived the fire. 
And another coincidence, uh, Linda Moulton Howe came and uh, she had another appointment in nearby Sedona, but she, this was an opportunity for her to go to the site and uh, collect some samples in regard to this uh, tree growth thing. And uh, so she calls up and, and does it. And when I go to pick her up, or, uh, I realize that it's November 5th, the, the anniversary of the incident. Just a total coincidence. She didn't arrange it, and I wasn't aware of it until it happened. So that was a pretty nervous time, uh, uh, guiding her to the site to, to uh, take samples on the uh, anniversary of the event. And so she took some samples to a lab and um, got some preliminary results, but uh, uh, very interesting stuff with those uh, that tree growth. Um, there was an, another odd coincidence that um, came to my attention. I, uh, a radio host from the Great Lakes area um, said, do you realize that the night you were returned was the same night uh, of the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald? Now, Gordon Lightfoot wrote a song about this, and uh, the, uh, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald happened on November 5th, 1975. And uh, the radio host told me that um, there was, uh, there was uh, other UFO sightings in connection with this, and there was a lot of mystery about why the ship went down. Um, and what was really strange is that the 29 crewmen disappeared without a trace. So, you know, the radio host was implying that, that, that they'd been abducted, and uh, maybe so, because the place where the ship went down wasn't, you know, the water wasn't much deeper than this ceiling of this room. Uh, when the ship hit the bottom, the parts of it was still above the ocean. And they recovered the ship within hours, and they never recovered a single body of those 29 men. But the night that I was returned, I made my call for help to my brother Grant. And uh, one of the crewmen on the uh, Edmund Fitzgerald was named Grant Walton. So another one of those weird coincidences. There's been a lot of them um, in connection with this. It turned out that the actor um, that who played Mike Rogers uh, was a second double cousin or something that he was related to him. And, um, a lot of uh, coincidences and, uh, involved in the whole thing, which I go into a lot of detail in, in the book, but um, I'm going to get ready to start taking some questions uh, from uh, people. Uh, oh, as far as the polygraph was concerned, uh, about the time the movie came out, um, a UFO investigator uh, uh, from the Midwest, uh, Jerry Black, uh, called Tracy up and said, what are you doing making a movie about this this crazy thing? Don't you know that's all been disproven? And he, you know, had heard all this stuff from Philip Class, and so they argued about it, and well, the upshot of the whole thing was that uh, he wanted to uh, have new polygraph tests done, you know? And uh, Tracy dropped out of the argument, but uh, Mike Rogers uh, continued it, and. Uh, Basically, they went back and forth and uh, wound up arranging new polygraph tests for him, for me, and for Alan Dallas. Uh, and he arranged them with Cy Gilson, uh, who was in private practice. And uh, they were, he was using, you know, state-of-the-art uh, methods that uh, have been developed at the University of Utah, in which the examiner scores it and the computer scores it. and. Uh, so there was kind of a double scoring system uh, to, you know, to remove the possibility of examiner bias or anything like that. And uh, uh, modern equipment, the best there is, and uh, we all passed at the, at the highest ratings uh, on new tests. I, I, I myself took two new tests. So, and then um, last August of uh, 2008, I uh, sought out more testing. Um, uh, Cy Gilson had retired, so the, the most rigorous testing I could find uh, was in the state of New Mexico because uh, results are admissible in court there. 
So uh, I checked around and other examiners uh, recommended this one guy, he was the best. Uh, he did uh, the testing for the uh, Albuquerque uh, Police Department, the uh, New Mexico State Prison, even the United States Marshals uh, Service. And uh, I took uh, two more tests from him and passed them at the highest level. So up to this point, I've taken six lie detector tests, which I passed uh, in, in regard to this matter. So I think as far as the polygraph's concerned, uh, enough already, you know. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of evidence. Uh, I go into great detail in, in the book, and uh, there's some more in, in the new book, um, which will be available in a week. And, uh, um, go, uh, you know, it's all there. And uh, up, up to now, um, my, my main critic of, uh, criticism of my critics has been uh, making up their minds without looking at the evidence. Um, you know, as, as well documented as this case is, and it's very extensive, uh, absolute proof has, you know, been uh, impossible to produce. But uh, I think, overwhelmingly, uh, the uh, skeptic's case has been, you know, according to observers, totally demolished. Um, in the book, I quote Emerson, um, condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. So, you know, my uh, reply to the, my critics is, is continues to be, uh, you don't have a right to an opinion if you don't look at the facts. So all I've asked is just take a look at the evidence and, uh, and you know, let the chips fall where they may. Think what you want to think. But uh, don't go by hearsay because there was a lot of rumors flying around, just totally uh, ridiculous things. I'm going to open it up for uh, questions. Uh, I was unable to get this thing to go backwards, but uh, uh, the uh, I worked with a, an artist. Uh, you know, he did 30 different versions before I picked the one that was closest, which still isn't exact, of course. But uh, um, so those illustrations that are there and they're in the book um, uh, are pretty are pretty accurate. Um, the um, ones that were called greys, they're called greys now. Back then, this was relatively new. There weren't a whole lot of other similar things, at least none that I knew of. Um, they were uh, short, uh, um, hairless beings. Um, one, th one thing that differs from what I consider a, a traditional grey uh, description is the eyes. These eyes were huge, but they uh, were actually, I actually saw them blink. You know, they were like, like, a, like a regular eye but just very, very large. And, uh, but you know, the human type being, they were, they were, uh, uh, you know, the no they were kind of Nordic looking, um, but there was something very odd about their eyes that I just never have been able to figure out. And, uh, you know, as far as the artistic renderings are concerned, that's, that's something I don't feel that I ever got completely correct. Um, but they were very, uh, young, healthy looking, very strong looking, and uh, um, kind of alike in a, in a family sort of way, but not, not like identical twins. So I've uh, often wondered if they might have been humans, you know? I don't know. If, if there was some connection with some Earth-based agency, maybe they were operating on behalf of them. I did not see any insignia or writing or, uh, you know, anything, but, you know, I took it to be a uniform. They were all dressed the same, but no markings. So, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, were they about your height? Would you say? Well, yeah, my height, they're a little, little taller. They were big, uh, healthy, strong people. They were easily able to overpower me. And, and you know, I was, I was uh, a logger. I, <laughs> I had a little strength when I wasn't uh, in an injured state. So.
So, thank you. Thank you. Next question. Hi, you probably get this question each time. Do you think um, the aliens saw the cliff cutting and they were concerned about cutting the trees? And the oh, and I, I couldn't quite hear you. Oh, uh, do you think that the space entities saw you clear cutting and they were concerned about the trees? <laughs> I mean, the fire, the look of the fire and the... The trees grew bigger afterwards, and they were angry, they threw you down. Oh. I'm sorry, I, I'm... <laughs> uh, is it this thing in my ear? <laughs> did, did you hear her question? Okay. <laughs> oh, I, no, actually, I think, you know, what we were doing, uh, there was logging in the area prior to this, and I think they're the ones who did all the damage. We're, we're really in there cleaning up. Um, we were... Uh, cutting down the disease trees, the ones that were damaged when they drive over them with a skitter, and, and uh, it was really, you know, a forest, uh, they call it timber stand improvement, TSI. So we were, we were trying to uh, fix some of the damage. Uh, I don't think it was a ecological thing at all. I, for a long time, I preferred to believe that, uh, that what my being taken was kind of an accident that was caused by me being foolish enough to get out and, and get too close. So there was one theory that when I jumped down behind the log, I was kind of doing so in a crouch. And then when I stood up to sprint back to the truck, at that point my upper body was closest to the, uh, to the craft that it was at any point. And that there may have been some sort of uh, static discharge or some sort of field built up in it that that uh, discharged this, you know, kind of like I was a, a grounding rod or something that, and it's, in other words, some kind of an accident. And then maybe they uh, had to clean up the mess. Do you feel at that point that they took you aboard a craft to monitor to you to make sure you were okay? Yeah, it could be that they were trying to fix me. It may be that uh, they did so. It may be that they didn't know enough about my body and they got these human-looking people involved to, I don't know, that's all speculation of who was cooperating, whether they intervened or were helping them. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a mystery. I'm sorry I wasn't able to hear you. Thank you. Hello, I have a few, few short questions. Okay. When you are you come out of the truck and you are close to the craft, and the, in the movie shows, that your face is like a smiling, like a little bit curiosity or some kind of attracted to the craft and like invited, feeling of invited, you like, I like, you like to be close to the, did you, that did correct you? Well, that wasn't, that wasn't precisely the way it was in the movie, you know. Um, When, we, when we do, we're doing all these interviews, uh, they interviewed Alan Dallas, and he said it, it looked to him like I was just being, like I was just compelled, like I was just being drawn in some hypnotic mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. towards it. But, you know, it was really different than that. I, w I was very curious about seeing it up close and like that. And, you know, when I did get up close, I was, uh, you know, standing there in awe, but a lot of fear. Uh -huh. And, uh, but at the same time, my initial motivation was just being a dumb show-off you know, to the, to, the, to the guys in the truck because it made them panic and so that kind of uh, got me going. Uh, but I, I live to regret that. Uh -huh. So <laughs> it was, okay. uh, it was, uh, it wasn't really like that. And you know, in the movie they had it looking like uh, lava, molten lava. But when we were telling them it looked like molten uh, steel, fresh from a blast furnace we're talking about like white hot it was a golden sort of a color not not reddish like that oh okay so now, uh, um yeah please yeah few, well, next one um when you i think i saw on the tv and uh, the drama your your drama i mean uh, tv movie and they, I, as far as i remember when you grab you landed in the ground you returned to the ground you were naked were you naked that no that was hollywood they, hollywood. they, okay. they gotta put nudity in okay. everything <laughs> <laughs> i wanted to make sure that <laughs> you know how to make no, it when i was returned uh, i was wearing the same clothes that i had been wearing okay uh, 
They did film some scene where I come upon some lovers in a car, and, uh, and they're naked, and I'm naked, and everybody's screaming. But fortunately, they did not use it. <laughs> okay. Now, when you returned, you are not amnesia, like you, 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 memory is you clear, because you called your brother or your family member. Well, so I was pretty you know, messed up. I was, uh -huh. you know, I was hanging by a thread, but... Uh, but you remember telephone number, so... Yeah, uh -huh. apparently. Now, there was a guy uh, that I knew, he claims that I called him and asked him to pick me up. And, you know, I haven't seen him in months and months. I have no memory of calling anybody but my family. But he swears that I called him uh -huh. and asked him to come and pick me up, and he didn't have a car at the time. <laughs> uh -huh. But I, I just don't think that happened. I, I think it was my family uh, that I remembered uh, the number and called him. Okay. Um, any... Is it all happened only once, or came back, the craft came back after well, that, or how? Time's up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if anything more was to happen, I would not make it public. You know, when I when I was returned, it was already international news, and so I was forced to, I, you know, I didn't voluntarily come forward about anything, so oh, okay. um, they tell me I'm out of time, but I will be out in the lobby okay, with uh, some, a few of my books. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Answer some more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much.